That leaves just one country in the world that mines and exports asbestos. And oh, uh, who could that be? Asbestos, if you're listening. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's Russia. Surprise, it's Russia. Welcome to Law and Chaos. Today, we're going to party like it's 1975 and talk about asbestos. We'll also discuss the state of the fake electors cases against Trump and his allies. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get after it. Happy Friday, Chaos Monkeys. I'm Liz Dye. I'm here, as always, with Andrew Torres. How are you, Andrew? I'm great, Liz. How are you? I'm all right. I'm uh, ready for it to be the weekend, although I, I have a lot going on this weekend. <laughs> I was going to say, are you so sure restful. about that one? <laughs> I know. I have a whole lot of family stuff going on this weekend. But um, you know what? It's a blessing, and I should not complain. Today, we will let Andrew don his hazmat suit and do a deep dive into uh, asbestos. Seems seems unsafe. But first, let's do a roundup of the fake electors cases, because there was some breaking news this week on that front. I, indeed, there was. And look, this dovetails really nicely with our newsletter. So if you're listening to the podcast, you probably know we do this show twice a week, Tuesdays and Fridays. We also put out written content twice a week as well on Mondays and Thursdays. So if you are a subscriber at any level, either at patreon.com slash law and chaos pod or on Substack over at law and uh, you will automatically get the newsletter delivered straight to your inbox and we never charge for these posts. Or you can just check them out yourself at law and Okay, so these are long-form articles. They're about 2,000 words a pop. They're written by either Liz or me or sometimes both of us together, and they really complement what we do here on the show. So, for example, yesterday's post was about the latest indictment of Ken Chesborough, along with Trump campaign fixer Mike Roman and a former Wisconsin state judge named James Troupas. And we go through the documents to show that uh, Chesborough is singing loudly to anyone who will listen, and some of those documents are smoking guns, let me tell you. So, you know, one of the benefits of the newsletter format is that we could, you know, screenshot Mike Roman saying, fuck those guys when talking about how they were deliberately misleading the cosplay electors or, you know, Jim Troopas telling Chesbro that uh, he needed to keep it on the down low about their secret meeting with Trump, which I, I didn't know they'd, they'd ever met with Trump. Apparently they had. So you should go read it. Patreon.com slash Lawn Chaos Pod. All right. So earlier this week, Wisconsin became the fifth state to hand down indictments in connection with the fake electors plot following Georgia, Michigan, Arizona and Nevada, which leaves only New Mexico and Pennsylvania, where there are no criminal proceedings against the goons who tried to help Donald Trump steal the election. And I I think you're going to. Yeah. And for good reason. Right. Uh, Put a pin in both those states, New Mexico and Pennsylvania. And that pin says Andrew was wrong. Impossible. Disbelieve. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, look, I'm going to own up to it. But before we get there, let's let's quickly summarize the fake electors plot. Right. In 2020, Joe Biden won the presidential election. He won it 306 electoral votes to 232. So that led a lot of people in Trump's orbit to try and brainstorm ways of stealing the election. And, you know, doing the math, if you flip 38 electoral votes from Biden to Trump, you change the result. But 38 electoral votes is a lot, as it turns out, right? So if you only start off with the states where Biden won narrowly, like let's say by half a percent or less, that's two states. That's Georgia and Arizona. So even if you toss out 22,000 Biden votes across those two states, that still only gets you 27 electoral votes. Okay, add in Wisconsin, which Biden won by six-tenths of a percent. That's another 20,000 votes you've got to toss out. That still only adds up to 37 electoral votes, and you need 38 to guarantee a win. So Trumpers also targeted Pennsylvania, where Biden won by more than a percentage point and 80,000 total votes, and Nevada and Michigan, where Biden won by an average of two and a half percent, and New Mexico, where, you know, Biden won by almost 11 points. 
Right. So the bottom line here is that Biden won all of these states by at least 10,000 votes. And look, recounts never, ever change 10,000 votes. They change like (laughs) dozens of votes, occasionally hundreds. The Wisconsin recount in 2020 added 87 votes to Biden's total. The Georgia recount added 1,274 Trump votes, which is still just a tenth of what he needed to flip the state. The Arizona hand recount, a.k.a. (laughs) the fraud it, added some (laughs) minimal number to Biden's column. But that was wholly unreliable as to be, you know, basically meaningless. The point is that Trump had no legal way to change the results of the 2020 election. Yeah. So that left the non-legal ways, which is why we have gotten very familiar with Trump lawyers like John Eastman and Ken Chesbro, right? These guys started with the result that they wanted, which was figure out a way to get Trump to have secretly won the 2020 election. And then their job was to concoct a bunch of crazy legal theories that ostensibly would get you there. And we're going to talk about the fake electors, but um, let's not forget some of these other plans, right? Like uh, started off with the idea that, you know, let's just have the Department of Justice hijack the election, seize all the voting machines, declare widespread voter fraud, despite there not being anything of the kind, right? But even Bill Barr, who, you know, arguably the most corrupt attorney general in our nation's history, thought that one was a bridge too far. Um, And, uh, you know, I feel like maybe people have forgotten that this is what Bill Barr told the January 6th committee on purpose. He said, and I told him, that's Trump, that the stuff his people were shoveling out to the public was bullshit. I mean, that the claims of fraud were bullshit. And, you know, he was indignant about that. And I reiterated that they wasted a whole month on these claims on the Dominion voting machines. And they were idiotic claims. End of real quote by real Attorney General Bill Barr. So look, they weren't going to get Bill Barr's help. Uh, that There was apparently that day after, like where Sidney Powell was named special election fraud czar or something. I mean, I, I think you're speaking about it in a funny way. And, and the specific event that you're talking about when Sidney Powell and Patrick Byrne and Mike Flynn um, and I think Rudy Giuliani snuck mm-hmm. in or well, not snuck in. They got waved in by Garrett Ziegler, whom we've talked about in a whole bunch of different contexts having to do with um, Hunter Biden. But Garrett Ziegler was one of Peter Navarro's aides and he kind of waved them into the White House and they got into the Oval Office. And it was that that showdown between Pat Cipollone and Eric Hirschman and they were like going to fist fight Mike Flynn and Eric Hirschman was like, sit your ass down. And, you know, they, Patrick Byrne was like memorably eating all of these like Swedish meatballs or something. But that that was the this was a sort of crazy meeting. I, think I Mark love Meadows doing the show too. with you. Liz. No, no, no. I mean, it was like it was just it's, it's a famous meeting and it's hilarious in its detail. It was it was so ridiculous. But also people remember that date because right after that is when Trump kind of realized it wasn't going to work um, and tweeted. Be there will be wild. I think December 19th is the date of that. Right. So it was it was where it became clear to Trump that he wasn't going to get what he wanted from the apparatus. He wasn't going to be able to use the apparatus of the federal government to to do what he wants. But the specific thing that you're talking about for a minute there, he said, I'm going to name Sidney Powell the special. I think it was like special counsel or so. You're right. Some sort of frauds are and that she was going to, you know, send the National Guard in to seize all of the voting machines. And basically everybody in the room was like, we're not listening to her and you do what you want. And the next day, Sidney Powell kind of called Mark Meadows up and was like, hey, how about my security clearance? And when am I going to get my office space? And he's like, mm, I'll get back to you on that one. Never. <laughs> I'll get back to you. Never. And and that that's what happened. But but yeah. it's I mean, hilarious. And also that was really a turning point. Because that that was when Trump knew he was going to have to get the mob to kind of descend on Congress if he wanted to hold power. And and we're going to talk about how that interacts. But I I wanted I do want to talk about some of the other plans that they concocted. Right, the Trump team came up with the idea of having states with Republican legislatures convene special sessions of those legislatures and just appoint Trump electors. Right, you know, disregarding that whole Democratic result thing, like. That would have definitely violated all sorts of laws. And, you know, again, fortunately, you know, small favors here. Uh, None of the Republicans in those states were willing to do that anyway. I mean, I don't think that's exactly not to nitpick, but actually a whole bunch of state Republicans were willing to do that. It's it's just that not they a critical mass. Yeah, <laughs> right. They, they couldn't reach, reach a critical mass. And right, for instance, in Georgia, Brian Kemp refused to convene a special session of the legislature so that they could snatch back 
you know, the electoral votes, which they wanted to give to Trump, they couldn't they couldn't steal the state's 16 electoral votes. And it's, I think similarly, like in, in Arizona, it was a, it was a similar thing. Rusty Bowers, the former House Speaker, testified to the January 6th committee and he testified publicly about the pressure campaign from Trump and especially from Rudy Giuliani, who said you have to reconvene the legislature so you guys can declare fraud and, you know, steal all the electoral votes. Right. And so one of the contingency plans that Trump land came up with was Ken Chesbro circulated a memo called the real deadline for settling a state's electoral votes. Right. And in that memo, we'll link it in the show notes. You've probably seen this before. Chesbro advanced the absolutely preposterous theory that if a state could somehow submit two different slates of electors at the same time, then January 6th became the real deadline because when Mike Pence was supposed to preside over the ceremonial joint session of Congress and and open the certificates that have their little gold seal on them and, you know, Mm -hmm. solemnly count the vote. Like instead, Chesbro said Pence could just, you know, pick which slate he wanted or he could throw them all out or he could just throw up his hands and say, I'm confused. I don't let's just send this back to the states for a couple of weeks. Right. Like anything to stop the inauguration of Joe Biden on January 20th. And that's why January 6th became the coup day, right? That's why must be there will be wild because they thought if they could stop this count, that that would prevent Biden from being inaugurated president. And, you know, we saw how far they were willing to go. Yeah. And I I think just as you and I are talking here, December 19th, when he sent the be there will be wild, that's kind of it's pretty clear evidence that he understood he Trump did understand. He understood this plot. I mean, he's talked about, well, it was just all my lawyers and whatever. But like, no, he himself sent that tweet because he understood that the that they weren't going to get what they wanted from the courts and they weren't going to get it. You know, the Justice Department wasn't going to go in and make this happen for him. He he needed the mob. And um, I think that's one of the things that January 6th committee really illustrated quite well. I think that's right. And one of the things that kept that plot in motion was having, right, as Chesbro suggested, the states submit two different slates of electors, right? Now, the normal way in which electors are chosen is that they're they're party officials and volunteers, right? The Democrats get together, they pick a bunch of people and, you know, former officials and volunteers, and they say, hey, if the state goes blue, we'll be the Biden electors. And the Republican Party get together and they get their people and they say, if the state goes red, you know, we'll be the list of Republican electors. And so they already had people picked out who had agreed to be Trump electors in these states that Biden had won, these seven states that Biden had won. And what Chesbro and John Eastman came up with was an idea to have those Republican electors, you know, the losing ones, sneak into basements and unused conference rooms and and in one case, actually a parking lot. I think that was the Nevada ones. They kind of tweeted this picture of themselves outside doing it or like, hey, we're the real electors. I think at least a couple of those guys got indicted since then and not in relation to the plot. But I digress. Yeah, no, they set up a table like they were tailgating. But yeah, right. Like this is why you have called them the cosplay electors since day one, because that's what they were doing. Pretending to be real electors, they signed this fake piece of paper that was kind of real looking that said they were the mm-hmm. real electors, and they sent off six copies to Congress and the National Archives, and and it set in motion that whole plan for January 6th. Yeah, I, I think it's important to note that a lot of the Republican would-be electors in the seven states refused to go along with it, in part because some of them were afraid that they would face criminal repercussion, but a lot of them were mm-hmm. like, this is bullshit. We <laughs> lost. What are you doing? Um, anyway, around a third of the Pennsylvania Republican delegation quit. So, you know, that left the Trump team having to do two things like they had to get, you know, Mike Roman and Rona Romney McDaniel, who was then the head of the RNC before Trump pushed her out recently. They had to corral new guys, right? They had to find new people on the ground. And Chesbro and Eastman and right, Jim Troopas in Wisconsin and Jack Willenchick in Arizona, they had to kind of convince these people, come up with plausible sounding legal justifications to do mm-hmm. it, which, you know, that you I think you did really well in, in your piece talking about how they convinced these people of things which they themselves knew were basically bad legal advice. Um, but that's that's why you've talked about Hawaii in 1960 or the 1876 election between Samuel Tilden and Rutherford Hayes or, you know, the Jefferson precedent or whatever those things. Right. Are, that Chesbro pointed to these things and told people who were less sophisticated than he 
is, was, right? Yeah. I mean, he is a very smart guy, right? He was a wonderkind at Harvard, right? And he told these people, oh, this is exactly like Hawaii in 1960. And he also kind of conveyed to them the false impression that what they were doing was contingent, right? It was contingent on yeah. some other thing happening. It wasn't saying, you present yourself as the electors and like cross your fingers and hope that Pence is willing to do something crazy, right? He was saying, well, you know, this is this is just a contingency plan. And it was not. It was not the insurance policy policy that it was sold to them as. Right. And in the newsletter, I go through the Chesbro documents to show how the Pennsylvania Republicans in particular pushed back against Chesbro and the Trump campaign, right? They would not sign the certification that Chesbro drafted for them saying that they were the duly elected electors of the state of Pennsylvania because they knew damn well that they weren't, right? Instead, what the Pennsylvania folks wanted and, and got was a disclaimer that said, on the understanding that if, as a result of a final, non-appealable court order or other proceeding prescribed by law, we are ultimately recognized as being the duly elected and qualified electors, blah, blah, blah. And then they signed it, right? So, so they really were, in a sense, contingent electors. And this is where I have to do my Andrew was wrong. <laughs> Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I said the other six states did not get that disclaimer, and uh, and that's because there was no documentation for that. But it turns out the New Mexico delegation also got something similar, even though it didn't show up in any of the Chesbrough documents, right? So the, the New Mexico certificate is not quite as good as Pennsylvania. It reads, on the understanding that it might later be determined that we are the duly elected electors. I don't even know what tense that. I mean, it's like some sort of passive voice that there, there's a name for it in German, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, there's subjunctive. Right, anyway, look, but but that deliberate passive voice was intentional, right? Chesbro strongly pushed back against what Pennsylvania wanted because they wanted determined by a court. And Chesbro could not say this to them, but was back channeling to Mike Roman saying, look, we, we still hope to have a rogue state legislature pick some electors, right? Or, or who knows what? Like, I don't want to say it's got to come from a court because we're not hoping this comes from a court anymore. We know we've lost in the courts. So that's how he got that additional language uh, written into the, the Pennsylvania, the, the other preceding language written into the Pennsylvania disclaimer. So, OK, here's the bottom line. We don't know exactly why the attorneys general in Pennsylvania and New Mexico haven't filed charges with respect to this fake elector scheme. But it's probably not a coincidence that those are the two states where the language in the certificate was contingent, right, mm -hmm. where, where it did not have the signatories presenting themselves as duly elected. They signed a stupid document. They submitted it, but it didn't really count in some case. So presumably that's why they did not wind up charged. But in the other five states, they didn't get that language. And in fact, you know, as you alluded to, Chesbro said, maybe we should put this in. I think these Pennsylvania electors have a point. And Mike Roman said, no, fuck those guys or whatever. It was like, whatever, whatever he said. He refused to put the language yeah, in. No, that's literally what he said. Yeah. Right, right. He's channeling Michael Jordan. So, OK, as we all know, Georgia, there's been this enormous wide-ranging conspiracy case filed against Trump and his minions like Rudy Giuliani and Jenna Ellis and Sidney Powell, John Eastman, Mike Roman, uh, as well as, you know, three of the fake electors, David Schaefer, Kathy Latham, and Sean Still. And remember, to review Mike Roman, same Mike Roman, right, is a former Koch brothers oppo researcher and all-around dirty trickster. He was charged in the Georgia Rico indictment, and he was offered a misdemeanor plea, which he turned mm -hmm. down. Instead, he was the mover behind that motion to disqualify Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis on the theory that she had a financial interest in the outcome of the case because she was romantically involved with special prosecutor Nathan Wade. Yeah. Good to remind everyone that the dirty trickster was the one behind that. Right. So we don't need to recap that whole saga. Remember, D.A. Willis hired three outside prosecutors. Two of them were highly, highly experienced in these kinds of cases. Uh, and one was less so. And uh, she had a romantic relationship with that third one, even as he spent over a year assembling this extremely complicated RICO case with 19 defendants, uh, when, you know, even impaneling the jury was likely to take months. So the argument that Roman made was that Wade, and by extension, Fonnie Willis, had a financial interest in prolonging the case. 
Right. And then after Roman made these allegations about her on MLK Day weekend, Fannie Willis made a speech at a famous African-American church in which she accused the defendants in this case of racism, which Trump's counsel then- not wrong. (laughs) I mean- and also, Trump's counsel said that was kind of an unlawful comment on the case by the prosecutor in violation of Georgia statutes. So they kind of added mm. that to the pile of yep. the reasons that she ought to be disqualified. And and not just her, but her entire office. So in March, Judge Scott McAfee ruled that he was not going to disqualify Willis in her office, but that Wade had to go, which, which he did. Wade resigned that day. But the order that Judge McAfee put out was pretty scathing. I'm going to read a little bit from it. He said, without sufficient evidence that the district attorney acquired a personal stake in the prosecution or that her financial arrangements had any impact on the case, the defendant's claims of an actual conflict must be denied. This Mm -hmm. finding is by no means an indication that the court condones this tremendous lapse in judgment or the unprofessional manner of the district attorney's testimony during the evidentiary hearing. Rather, it is the undersigned's opinion that Georgia law does not permit the finding of an actual conflict for simply making bad choices, even repeatedly, and it is the trial court's duty to confine itself to the relevant issues and applicable law properly brought before it. Other forums or sources of authority, such as the General Assembly, the Georgia State Ethics Commission, the State Bar of Georgia, the Fulton County Board of Commissioners, or the voters of Fulton County may offer feedback on any unanswered questions that linger, but those are not the issues determinative to the defendant's motions alleging an actual conflict. Yeah. And let me say, when the judge says, I'm not going to throw you off the case, but you should maybe catch a bar complaint or an ethics complaint, like... That's not a win, right? So look, the defendants moved for a certificate of immediate review, which is the Georgia term for an intermediate interlocutory appeal, right? So that they could go immediately to the Georgia Court of Appeals and seek review of Judge McAfee's disqualification ruling. Judge McAfee didn't have to grant that, but he did. And normally when you do that, it stays the case. But but in that ruling, Judge McAfee said, unless directed otherwise by an appellate court, supersidious, right, that, that's the bond that you post to stay everything on appeal, shall apply only to the order being appealed. The court intends to continue addressing the many other unrelated pending pretrial motions, regardless of whether the petition is granted and even if any subsequent appeal is expedited by the appellate court. Right. So that sort of left the door open for Judge McAfee to keep working on this case, Mm -hmm. although in the normal course of things, it would effectively freeze the trial proceedings, this this certificate of immediate review. And then yesterday, the Georgia Court of Appeals officially stayed the ruling. It it granted that it said it was going to hear the case, I believe, in October. Um, But then it said, no, Judge McAfee, you, you need to stop working. And I know October seems kind of far away. Because it is. But (laughs) um, this court does move pretty fast. It has a rule about finishing within two terms. So I believe they will be done their work by March is what I understand their deadline. But then whatever whatever happens, it's going to be appealed to the Georgia Supreme Court. So look, brass tacks, this case is off the calendar for the foreseeable future. Um, It's not great. Yeah, it's not. And in that appeal, the Trump defendants are going to get a second bite at a whole lot of apples, right? Because now, as a matter of Georgia state law, they can ask the appellate court to weigh in on all of Judge McAfee's rulings now, not just the disqualification order. Why that's their procedural law, I have no idea. That makes no sense. But that's how Georgia appellate procedure works. That's what we're stuck with. Yeah. And I just want to say something before we move on, because we took some flack, as did Andrew Fleischman. He's a Georgia defense attorney. He's been on the show. He's, you know, he's always, he's really generous with his time. And he said, look, this is bad. Right. And he's tangled a lot with the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. And I'm not saying like, oh, good, we told you so. But I think a lot of people on our side of the aisle wanted to minimize this bad behavior. And it was bad behavior. It was a terrible lapse of judgment, you know, uh, to do this, to, to right, you know, this is the biggest case of her career. There was a lot riding on this. And, you know, I, I don't think that they prolonged this case because they wanted Nathan Wade to, like, enrich himself on the public fisc. I just think they were stupid about it. And this, you know, it's had a tremendous consequence. This case would be moving much faster if they hadn't engaged in this relationship. Yeah. uh, Let me push back on that just a little bit, right? Because I don't disagree uh, Mm -hmm. that, you know, we wanted to analyze this appropriately. Uh, I certainly don't disagree that uh, Andrew Fleischman was super helpful, came on our show, right? Right. (laughs) But I think Mike Roman, the dirty tricksters, the Trump people, they would have come up with some other bullshit reason here if they hadn't found that. I definitely don't think that 
anything, that any decision that was made should have resulted in the kind of relief that they got, which is now that the case has stayed for a year. Like, uh, so I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know that I would, I would pin the blame on our side of the aisle other than to say, oh, I like, don't pin the blame on our side of the aisle either. I, I, I think my point is that props to Andrew Fleischman. He's a Georgia defense attorney. He's come on the show and he said from the jump that the prosecutors had endangered this case by their lapse of judgment. And a lot of people on our side said that he was making a mountain out of a molehill. I, I think, you know, people like and people that we respect, like Norm Eisen said, there's no reason that this should result in the disqualification of her office. And I think it probably ultimately won't result in the disqualification of her office. But I do think that we have an obligation to say things that are true and not to feed people hopium and that, you know, Andrew Fleischman was right and we were right when we said this is a big problem. And, um, you know, look, we have a job here. Our job is to say things that are true. And this was a shitty true thing. And exactly what he said he feared came to pass. So, you know, it sucks. I don't disagree with any of that. I just want to say none of that should be construed as saying that this was not bad faith defendants seizing on whatever they possibly could to try and throw as much crap at the wall in a Agreed. case where they're guilty as hell. Yeah. Agreed. So we're clear. We're we're all still, <laughs> you know, very reluctantly on team prosecution here. But that's right that, you know, it was not – the folks who said, oh, Judge McAfee is never going to take this seriously, uh, they, they, they turned out to not be correct on that one. <laughs> okay. All right. If you are a subscriber at patreon.com slash lawandchaospod or at lawandchaospod.com over on our sub stack, then let's get back on with the show. And uh, otherwise, we will see you on the other side after we pay some bills. Okay, so that was Georgia. Next up is Arizona, which we broke down a couple of months ago with Arizona lawyer Tom Bryan. He told us about Arizona Attorney General Chris Mays has indicted many of Trump's cronies, including Giuliani, Mike Roman, Jenna Ellis, Christina Bob, Boris Epstein, and Mark Meadows, along with all of that state's fake electors. You can contrast that with Michigan and Nevada, where only the cosplay electors caught an indictment. Yeah, and I should add, because this question came up when the Arizona indictment came down and, and Trump was listed as an unindicted co-conspirator, mm -hmm. right? There is nothing preventing any of those states from adding Donald Trump or anybody else to their indictments, right? So long as the statute of limitations hasn't run. But to do that, you have to go back to the grand jury and you have to get them to hand down a superseding indictment, right? Like that, that's, that's work. That can't just be an internal prosecution decision. Okay. And that takes us to Tuesday in Wisconsin, where Ken Chesbro, Mike Roman, and James Troupas were indicted. Troupas is a, as we said, former Wisconsin judge who collaborated in the fake electors plot in that state. Trump was not indicted, could be indicted again in the in the future, but uh, but we shall see. Okay. So Chesbro, Troupas, and Roman, all three indicted for conspiracy to commit forgery under Wisconsin statute section 943.382 which makes it a crime to possess with intent to utter as genuine any forged writing or object, such as a fake certification of electoral votes. That's a class H felony punishable by a fine not to exceed $10,000 or imprisonment not to exceed six years or both. I'll take it. Six years. Yes. Yeah. Done. I, no, maybe I not. I have a feeling, yeah, on a practical basis, right? You know, Remember that New York 17510, the false business records, has a maximum penalty of four years. And, you know, we don't, yeah. And, and remember that Chesbro has managed to keep himself out of jail thus far, so. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> He's. Yeah, uh, he is he is made of like that the super slippery Teflon. But okay, anyway, all right, look, uh, one of the interesting studies in contrast here, Chesbro managed to keep himself out of being named at all in the Arizona indictment, and pretty much everybody suspects that that's because of the cooperation that he provided to Arizona Attorney General Chris Mays, right? Turns out he didn't get quite so lucky in Wisconsin. And uh, and the reason why, I think we suspect, is buried in footnote five of that criminal complaint. So in that it says, 
On December 20th, 2023, I, and, and that refers to Mary Von Schoik of the Wisconsin Department of Justice's Division of Criminal Investigation. So she was the one who, who verifies and signs the complaint. She said, anyway, I participated in an interview of Kenneth Chesbro. In connection with the interview, counsel for Defendant Chesbro produced various documents. In the interview, Defendant Chesbro stated that although he had a Twitter account, he did not send messages through it. However, she goes on to note, Per a CNN K-file investigation, defendant Chesbro appears to have sent numerous messages during that time period relevant to the complaint using a Twitter account named Badger Pundit. Yeah, let me just give you just a little 30-second backgrounder on this one. <laughs> because uh, Chesbro's from Wisconsin, and uh, so, you know, Wisconsin, Badger State, right? Got it. So Chesbro had this secret account, which was discovered by CNN reporter Andrew Kaczynski. And he, Chesbro used this account to not only say like, well, these are great ideas and sort of flog his faked electors plot, but to also <laughs> he reached out to a bunch of um, people in the conservative orbit. So one of those people was Jim. Have you Hoff, noticed how handsome people. that Ken Chesbro is? No, <laughs> he, no but he, he, he reached out um, and he didn't, I think he reached out pseudonymously, but he reached out to a bunch of conservative commentators, including Jim Hoft, who's of the Gateway Pundit, <laughs> and David Clark, who was the sheriff of Milwaukee. He was like this lunatic. You can recognize pictures of him because he was this crazy guy who wore like 50 different kind of badges and medals and all of his outfits. He's, <laughs> badges. he's, he's all the way. Yeah, he definitely did need no stinking badges. Um, so Chesbro kind of DM'd these people and was like, I have lots of money and I've, you know, I have a block of hotel rooms on January 6th at the Trump Hotel in D.C. You know, come and hang out with us. Be there. It will be wild. And most of the people um, were like, uh, I don't know you weirdo, but cool. Um <laughs> I'm not going to Badger Pundit's hotel room. Like. Yeah, no, pass on that one too. But the point was that when asked, like, did you have any communications with anybody and did you communicate on social media with anybody? He said in this interview, no, I did not. And that was a lie. And like, for God's sake, if you're trying to get a cooperation agreement, like don't take legal advice from a podcast. But uh, yeah, it, uh, never a great look to lie to the person who can indict you. Yeah, I just really don't understand because clearly it wasn't this guy's first rodeo. Like he's, you know, been indicted in Georgia and he, you know, managed to keep himself out of jail. Like, remember, he's the one that said, I would like to assert my speedy trial, right? And he and he and Sidney Powell on the theory that Fonnie Willis would blink and not want to do this trial twice. And, you know, they're starting to impanel the jury. And he was like, oh, I guess she's not going to blink and immediately pled. And then so did Sidney Powell. But I'm, yep. I mean... He does seem to have a pretty good survival instinct, uh, and he is, as we said, a lawyer, but uh, that, uh, you know, not not great, Bob. Not smart. Okay, so one last piece of background information to kind of put this whole story together, because in addition to the Wisconsin criminal investigation, there was also a civil lawsuit that was brought against Chesbro, Troopas, and the cosplay electors. And we go into this in a lot of depth in the post. That's why you should go over and read it, uh, lawandchaospod.com. Uh, but basically, the Georgetown University Law Center's Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, ICAP, they represented plaintiffs who sued all of those people, the Wisconsin fake electors, Chesbro, Troopas. And one of their explicit goals was to shake loose more information to the public about the fake electors plot, right? So that meant that while the plaintiffs ultimately were willing to settle with Chesbro and let him out of the case, as a condition of that settlement, Chesbro turned over and waived confidentiality. That's why I've been able to read them over what the GLUC describes as, quote, a trove of documents. And let me tell you, this was indeed a treasure trove, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, I, they show Chesbro constantly running back and forth daily, multiple times a day to the Trump campaign, right? Either Mike Roman or Trump's fixer, Boris Epstein, who himself got indicted in Arizona, and it's about damn time, or some other dweeb with an at DonaldTrump.com address. Yeah. So bottom line here, when the Georgia and D.C. election interference cases go forward against Donald Trump, and yes, obviously it's not going to be until 2025 at the earliest, which sucks. Uh, and if you don't vote for Joe Biden, it may be never. But when those cases get back on track, it will be very difficult for Trump to argue that he did not know what was going on, as I pointed out, right, that he yeah. he tweeted that, you know, be there will be wild because he knew that January 6th was the day and he knew exactly why. Yeah. So, all right, let's take another ad break, after which we will come back and talk asbestos. I can't wait. <laughs> All right. 
Asbestos. Andrew, let's get to it. Is this another thinly veiled effort for you to fill our script with 1980s references? Will there be air supply? <laughs> Fifth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, I'm pretty sure that asbestos is banned in U.S. America I, at this point. You, I, I thought so, too, but not until recently, right? And, and to understand why, our story begins in eras past. No, not 13th century Saxony, but with Richard Nixon. <laughs> and, uh, and for once, we're mentioning Richard Nixon not because he was less of a crook than Donald Trump. Uh, but so anyway, in 1971, Nixon's Council on Environmental Quality issued a report calling for comprehensive federal legislation to control chemicals whose manufacture, processing, distribution, use or disposal was potentially dangerous to human health. Oh, the halcyon days when Republicans actually believed in governing and not killing people. Yeah, yeah. being a climate change denialist was not an article of faith. But yeah, okay, look. Yeah. But let, let's let's not uh, bend too far over backwards. They were still Republicans, right? So Nixon's counsel led to the eventual passage of the Toxic Substances Control Act, or TSCA, in mm-hmm. 1976. That is 15 USC, Section 2601 at SEC. And the TSCA, some might say because it was a Republican plan, was not enacted to ban any particular substance. It was enacted to, quote, balance public health and environmental risks with economic costs and benefits. So, for example, Section 2605 of the Act says that the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, has the authority to screen chemicals used in manufacturing and commerce and, and then I'm going to quote directly here, If the administrator determines after testing, which is set out in a later subsection, that the manufacture, processing, distribution in commerce, use or disposal of a chemical substance or a mixture presents an unreasonable risk of injury to health or to the environment, the administrator shall by rule apply one or more of the following requirements to such substance or mixture to the extent necessary so that the chemical substance or mixture no longer presents such risk. And 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 then it, it lists seven things that the EPA can do. And they they include you know, minimal stuff like requiring warning labels, requiring additional record keeping, requiring public notice of the use of the chemical, requiring heightened disposal procedures. Uh, and then it goes all the way up to limiting or banning the chemical outright. So, oh, and they can do that either entirely or just for certain uses. So what I want you to take away from here is broad discretion to the EPA as to what to do with respect to toxic chemicals. But... Before they can do that, the standard that the EPA must prove, and as you might imagine, the standard has been heavily litigated in the last five decades, is to show an unreasonable risk of injury to health or to the environment. So in other words, if something presents a reasonable risk to health or injury to the environment, or Uh more importantly, if something presents an unknown risk to health or the environment, then the EPA lacks authority to do anything about it under the TSCA. And as you might imagine, that's taken quite a lot of the teeth out of the act, right? So let's put some numbers on it. Since its passage in 1976, the EPA has investigated and kept records on more than 80,000 chemicals produced in or imported into the United States. They have only ordered that heightened testing, that's subsection B4A, for 200, that is 0.25%. And of those, the EPA has only promulgated regulations for five. (laughs) PCBs, chlorofluorocarbons, dioxin, hexavalent chromium, and asbestos. But as I said before, that's just the list. That's not the list of chemicals that, that have been banned. That's only the list of chemicals that have been regulated under the TSCA. Right. And in fact, the EPA did try and ban asbestos back in 1989, but was shut down in 1991 by the Fifth Circuit, which always sucked and <laughs> continues to suck even more now. Uh, the case was called Corrosion Proof Fittings v. EPA, which held that the EPA didn't do enough fact finding about the health hazards of asbestos. Uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, even today, asbestos is uh, estimated to cost the U.S. approximately $11.75 billion per year in human health costs. But like, oh, you know, means some more fact finding. I did not enough fact finding on the health risks of asbestos. Like, seriously, turn on any football game. There will be eight commercials for if you're suffering from mesothelioma. All right. Anyway, so 
in 2016. I live here, Peter Angelo's <laughs> land, thanks. Uh, well, not anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> Harsh. Harsh. So in 2016. Hey, Baltimore. I, 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 I live here too, and uh, Peter Angelos and I tackled on a bunch of occasions. So anyway, in 2016, Congress Not amended anymore. the TSCA. Yeah. <laughs> good, good point. <laughs> and that amendment increased the requirements on industry to turn over information to the EPA, and it increased the EPA's authority to conduct testing and share out information with the states, with regulators, with chemical industry workers, and to the public, right? So in other words, to try and get around that information bottleneck to, to meet that heightened standard. And the net effect of that was to make it easier to do the more fact-finding that the Fifth Circuit said they needed to do. And so the amended 15 U.S.C. section 2605, subsection 2A, now said, not later than 180 days after June 22nd, 2016, the administrator of the EPA shall ensure that risk evaluations are being conducted on 10 chemical substances drawn from the 2014 update of the TSCA work plan for chemical assessments and shall publish the list of such chemical substances during that 180-day period. So the EPA chose asbestos as one of those 10 chemicals on which to perform an updated risk evaluation and put that in motion. That was, if you're keeping track of the calendar, December 19th, 2016, in the last few weeks of Barack Obama's term. And y'all know what happened next. I do. Uh, Donald Trump named Scott Pruitt, who was a congressman from Oklahoma, as administrator of the EPA. And, you know, it was terrible in a whole bunch of valences, but it, it was an amazing run for me because I was covering Scott Pruitt at Wonkett uh, at the time. And Scott <laughs> Pruitt was just like this amazing corruption ball of fire. And every day you would be like, wait, what now? Like he, he was constantly like trying to sending his government, you know, secretary to like source, I shit you not, a used mattress from the Trump hotel in DC. He wanted to get a like, I'm sorry, like, what? I, I, people, get, I can understand, like, because he what he wanted was a mattress that had not only been slept on by one or two people. What he wanted was one that had been slept on by thousands of people. And uh, he's actually apparently a quite a hotel aficionado. One of the other tasks was uh, he really liked the hand lotion. I think it was like at the Sheraton or something. And so he sent his secretary to find it. But but he had I mean, those were those were sort of little picky and shit. Right. But the things that he did, um, he had all of these no-show employees and he was like using emergency EPA funds to give his friends a raise and he constantly had a motorcade so that he could drive through DC and get to lunch by like putting the lights on you know on the car so he could have the rollers and stuff like he was just he was amazing he was constantly firing somebody like drew horns there was a picture of him in the elevator and somebody drew like devil horns on it from which he inferred that he mm -hmm. needed all kinds of stepped up security detail because he was, <laughs> it was an assassination attempt or something. Like, sure. he, he was amazing. This has nothing to do with what we're talking about. You've just you just kind of triggered me. Anyway, the point was Pruitt's actual job was to, you know, run the EPA. And um, so he tasked this underling with overseeing the EPA's toxic chemical unit. This woman's name was Nancy Beck. She had previously worked as an executive at the American Chemistry Council, the principal lobbying group for the asbestos industry. So she knew whereof she spoke. And so a few months earlier, the American Chemistry Council had written a letter to the EPA arguing that chlorine manufacturers should be able to continue to use asbestos in water filtration which is an exception, which would basically swallow the rule because mm -hmm. the chlorine industry is responsible for more than 90% of the importation of asbestos into this country. And so like, you know, if you're going to have an exception that covers 90% of the importers, then you don't have an exception. You just have a rule. So right. Beck got to read this letter, which she had promulgated in her previous career as an asbestos lobbyist into the record. Um, and surprise, surprise, she, she agreed with it. And so when the Trump EPA finally promulgated its asbestos rule, uh, the final rule in 2019, it exempted the chlorine industry. Instead, it prohibited it, the industry from resuming previously discontinued uses of asbestos, such as making adhesives or sealants or insulation liners and sealing tiles and whatever. So it said, all that stuff you already couldn't do, you can't do it. And all the stuff that Nancy Beck's clients used to be doing and would like to still be doing, they can keep on doing it. 
cool. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so like, just to be clear, like I, I don't want to go all libertarian here and invite bears into our backyard or whatever, but like the one thing the EPA definitely didn't need to do was ban asbestos ceiling tiles and stuff, right? Like there's a reason those things have been discontinued for four decades, right? Like there's not a market for that stuff because let, let me be pollutedly clear about this, right? Like if a builder uses asbestos tile in your house or asbestos insulation and you get mesothelioma, you know who to sue, right? You sue the builder, you sue the tile manufacturer, and probably the home inspector who didn't discover it, right? Like, But if you get mesothelioma because a gasket in a chlorine plant leaked friable asbestos into the chlorine, which was then circulated through the public swimming pool, like, I, how do you know? Like, it, it's so much harder to figure out who's responsible mm-hmm. for what and why. And that's why you need government regulation and by the way, that's why the chlorine plants still use the asbestos gaskets. So in other words, in 2019, Trump's EPA turned Congress's authorization that would have made it possible for them to once and finally ban asbestos into a rule that prohibited the asbestos industry from doing stuff that it had no intention of doing anyway, while exempting the single largest use that was almost entirely responsible for continuing to import all of the asbestos into the United States. That's 350 plus tons of it every single year. Yeah. And look, speaking of importing, asbestos has not been manufactured in the U.S. since 2002 because, you know, an industry which has a 100% chance of like causing you to be the defendant in a class action lawsuit is, is not, you know, it's not a big seller at this point. But until no. Trump took office, the chlorine industry imported asbestos from Brazil. Brazil finally stopped mining and producing asbestos in 2016. So that leaves just one country in the world that mines and exports asbestos. And oh, uh, who could that be? Asbestos, if you're listening. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's Russia. Surprise, it's Russia. Um, so in June of 2018, two nonprofits flagged the official Facebook page of a company called Ural Asbest, which is one of Russia's biggest asbestos mining companies, reported to have close ties to Vladimir Putin. Amazing. Uh, that page shared out a picture of pallets of asbestos wrapped and stamped with a red seal of Trump's face, along with the words, approved by Donald Trump, the 45th president of the United States. Uh, Real picture. Else. We'll link in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm going to assume that Trump didn't like license his image for that. But, uh, you know, yeah. I'm going to uh, assume he didn't file a lawsuit against Oral Asbalest. <gasps> yeah. Right. So among everything else, Trump has publicly been an asbestos skeptic, claiming in his 1997 book, The Art of the Comeback, that anti-asbestos efforts were a conspiracy, quote, led by the mob because it was often mob related companies that would do the asbestos removal. Sure. He's a hell of a guy. And in 2012, Trump tweeted, if we didn't remove incredibly powerful fire retardant asbestos and replace it with junk that didn't work, the World Trade Center would never have burned down. This person was elected president of the United States. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so all of that coincidental background led to this really weird disclosure from Trump's EPA back in 2019. So here was the, it was, you know, in an FAQ format. So the question Does the EPA allow the import of asbestos from Russia? Answer. EPA cannot simply ban imports regardless of their source for current uses unless its ongoing evaluation under the Toxic Substances Control Act identifies unreasonable risk associated with such importation. The new rule, when final, would prevent import, including from Russia and anywhere else, for the uses in the rule. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Liz, as you pointed out, the uses in the rule did not touch the chrysotile asbestos that was used in chlorine water purification. So oral asbest and other Russian companies continued to ship tons and tons of asbestos into the United States. And that, at long last, takes us to the EPA's final rule on asbestos. 40 CFR Part 751 issued March 28th, 2024. It declares in no uncertain terms that chrysotile asbestos presents an unreasonable risk to human health, and it prohibits the manufacture, import, processing, distribution, and commerce, and commercial use of chrysotile asbestos in the chlorine industry and in two other minor uses, finally closing that last loophole. So, Liz, we can now say that, yes, asbestos is banned in the United States. 
Amazing. In 2024. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. You know, I kind of think that you undersold this story. Like after we talked about all of those assholes getting indicted, I think we should have said, hey, guys, good news about asbestos. Like we, we really <laughs> maybe should have flagged it. And look, while we're talking about good news, we don't have time to get into it today. But uh, speaking of good news, Steve Bannon is going to the big house. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes. Judge is. Carl Nichols <laughs> said, well, I'm not going to stay your sentence. You can uh, self-report by July 1. Which Trump and all of the minions lost their shit about. And we're talking about how it's a DOJ plot. I guess they forgot who put Judge Carl Nichols on the bench. Yeah. Judge Carl Nichols, not only Trump appointee, but a pretty Trumpy judge in D.C. To, to date, he's been publicly sympathetic about a number of the January 6th defendants. Like when you've lost Carl Nichols, you know, you've lost the plot. But uh, but but there we have it. spoiler alert. They've lost the plot. OK. <laughs> That's going to do it for us today. We hope you have a lovely weekend. We will be back with written content on Monday as usual. And we will be back with a special interview with someone who took on Moms for Liberty and won. Love it. All right. See you guys. Law and Chaos Podcast is a production of Raise Ipsa Media, LLC, is intended solely as entertainment, does not constitute legal advice, and does not form an attorney-client relationship. This show is researched and written by Liz Dye and produced by Bryce Blankenangle. Law and Chaos Pod, copyright 2024, Raise Ipsa Media, LLC, all rights reserved.